When I was 18, I got an Xbox One for my birthday. It was my first console, and the first game I bought was Destiny. I crouched in the dark of my bedroom after my parents had gone to bed, clumsily fought my way through Fallen and woke up the war mind. And ten years later, that same dusty console carried me dutifully through Destiny 2 The Final Shape. What is, in my opinion, the perfect end to this ten year saga. Firstly, hello, my name is Jade, otherwise known as Scarlet Rebel, and this is my little review of the Final Shape DLC. There be spoilers ahead because I was too busy having a semi-life crisis to get this video out in a fashionable manner, so if somehow you're a Destiny player and you haven't played Final Shape, fix that, because it's good, <laughs> and you're going to listen to me talk about how good it is for this entire video. This video won't touch on anything from Season of Echoes because that's still ongoing, However, there may be spoilers for things before the final shape launched, so just bear that in mind. So, where do we start? Actually, heh, <laughs> you know what? I know exactly where to start. Let's start with Lightfall. They've used this method of storytelling the entire time, and we've all got why it. Is it, it makes so sense that they'd keep doing it with Lightfall, since, you know, that's so many people have, have great power careers now based on unraveling it. Would it have been immediate? Even with the narrative of the entire the Iron Ball to work as long as time, we didn't know anything about that game. And that's not okay. So for some reason, it's not okay. That is one thing, please trust us. Like we're all five year olds in math class, when we all know that we're having ear work and storytelling ahead. Upon reflection, was Lightfall as strong a DLC as it could have been? No, it wasn't. In my opinion, the story was a stepping stone. Strand was fun, and it set a strong foundation for Final Shape. I like the Veil as a mystery box narrative device, but I think it should have been set up in the previous seasons a lot better than it was. As it stood, all we had was Rasputin name dropping it at the very end of Season of the Seraph, which didn't impose upon the player the importance of it stopping the witness. I like Neo Muna and the Cloud Striders in theory, but Nimbus's character didn't quite hit home, and Rohan's sacrifice could be seen from a mile away. The history behind Neo Muna could have used some integrating into the world naturally, rather than most of it being in lore, but that's a criticism that would expand across the seasons between Lightfall and Final Shape, with important story beats being confined to lore pages for reasons that can only really be speculated upon, was it time or money or both. Now you may be wondering, Jade, why didn't you make your own review of Lightfall then? Why are you saying all of this over a year later? Because when I got online after playing it, I felt like I was in another dimension. As Taylor Swift once said, I'd rather burn my whole life down than listen to one more second of all this bitching and moaning. Which yes, I recognise is ironic, but I'm here now and I'm not stopping. God, it was awful. It was the trenches out here. God forbid you thought the story was fine. God forbid you enjoyed playing it. Because those on high were decreeing to the sheep-like masses that Bungie had committed the ultimate sin. A transitional story that was only okay. There were people out here claiming that they were worried about the skills of the narrative team, that they didn't think Bungie would be able to pull off the final shape and the end of a 10 year saga after creating an okay story for a DLC that was a last minute addition. Yeah, when Beyond Light was announced, they planned for Witch Queen to go right into final shape, but then they created Lightfall because they felt the story needed it. Actually Jade, no, that's not correct. <laughs> I got this completely wrong and mixed up. I'm recording this voiceover as I'm editing, so I apologize if it's not as good quality as the rest of my recording. I basically kind of misremembered and thought that Lightfall was added in and Final Shape was announced first, which was not the case. Beyond Light, Witch Queen, Lightfall were announced. They never actually said, Bungie never actually confirmed whether or not Lightfall was going to be the end, but then in the Witch Queen reveal, they said that there was going to be the final shape to actually end the Light and Darkness saga. I was getting it mixed up, kind of, I guess, maybe Mandela Effect, I don't know. I was getting it mixed up because obviously post Lightfall, there was a lot of people claiming that everything good in Lightfall was going to be in final shape, or Lightfall and final shape got mix, uh, messed up even based on the fact that they had created Final Shape. So that was why my brain was a little bit confused. Okay, thank you, bye. There was no way we could have just gone straight into the Traveler after the Witness. It would have massively undermined the cosmic forces at play and the sacrifices that needed to happen to drive home that this was the end of the line. Crow needed to earn the Hunter Vanguard position, Akora and Zavala needed to strengthen themselves, and we needed to get the band together. We couldn't have done that between Witch Queen and Final Shape in my opinion, not to mention it would have been far too much of a crunch for Bungie, and that criticism about important story beats being contained to lore books would have been inflated, 
because there just wouldn't have been time to put it in the seasons. And then where would we be? All of that to say, the community did a number on me last year. And fuck it. I fully believe that the unnecessarily harsh, loud, and overdramatic criticism of Lightfall had a hand in the layoffs. Now, I'm not saying that any one law YouTuber or streamer is directly responsible for people losing their jobs, that's ridiculous. What I am saying is that in my heart of hearts, I believe it contributed. Let me remind you that some community members went on to apologise for things they said in their initial Lightfall reactions, so just let that sink in. That being said, I am happy to hear that the public backlash to the layoffs allegedly made CEOs at Bungie and Sony listen to the team leaders more, which obviously resulted in a perfect DLC. Yeah, perfect, I said it. Apparently the delay wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for that backlash, and thank God. Crunch was absolutely a leading factor for the final shape, and I'm so glad it was delayed because there were so many things that the devs did not feel super great about, and that delay gave them the time to do that. And then on the positive side of the layoffs, the layoffs gave them such bad PR. Leadership was forced to listen to the teams, and that's good. That's what we need. That's what we want. So, can we as a community all agree to use our voices for good, like unfair layoffs and encouraging those in the gaming world to unionize, and not for whiny piss baby reasons like, oh, I don't know what the veil is, it's so stupid. Anyway. Between Lightfall and Final Shape, we needed to come up with a plan. We needed to figure out how to get into the Traveller after the Witness, and how to defeat the Witness. Things started... not too well. <laughs> But after saving random civilians from being captured by the Shadow Legion for reasons that were never revealed or critiqued upon, we learned by reuniting with Deputy Commander Salone the origins of the Witness. From there we had to deal with Ziva or Wrath by turning Eris Morn into a Hive God temporarily, but through that event we found out that Savathun had made a wish with Riven and Ahamkara to be able to traverse through the portal the Witness had created. However, only one person could go through. Riven granted us this wish instead of Savathun after we helped find her children and Crow went through the portal, his connection to his sister Mara allowing us to know when we could follow. It took a few months, but once through the portal, Crow came face to face with Cade Six, the former Hunter Vanguard, and the man Prince Aldrin killed, and we all waited for the moment where we could follow. So, Final Shape's story is cohesively perfect. The decision to make the story linear and not really allow for any breathing room I think was a great choice, because it kept the player locked into what was going on. The way we crept closer and closer to the Witness's monolith throughout the story made it feel like we were descending the nine circles of hell, and every story mission, every area we unlocked as we went provided more insight and explanation as to what the hell was even going on. Every time I had a question, it was answered, every cutscene was impactful and the characters reacted to each revealed piece of information with an amount of gravitas that we haven't really seen before, only in radio comms and lore pages. Each mission was fun, and integrating them into the areas of the Pale Heart made exploring later a lot easier because we knew where everything was. I could feel through experiencing the story how the narrative team had room and time to breathe. They had the space to craft a really satisfying story, so again, thank god for that delay. They knew they had to not only conclude a 10 year saga that, let's be honest, started on really shaky ground, they also had to weave it into activities, plant seeds for the future, make sure every character played a role, all while making sure the story and gameplay married together to maintain a forward momentum for the player. And in my opinion, they nailed it. I'm starting to get anxious that people will think that since I have nothing bad to say, that somehow makes my opinion disingenuous. But honestly, the only critiques I have are not even necessarily critiques, and I am going to touch on them. So overall, Final Shape is just a 10 out of 10 for me. But let's get into specifics. I'm going to rip the band-aid off here. I should have known that Kid wasn't going to stick around. I mean, he said it himself in his final message to us. He couldn't just stroll back into the tower. There isn't space for him in the Destiny universe anymore. But what I think is so beautiful about the arc he goes on during Final Shape is that it's emblematic of so much. Holding on to the past, punishing yourself for it failing to see the future, wanting things to change without thinking about the consequences, but also making the most of the situation you're in, being there for the ones that need you, passing on the torch with everything you've learned, leaving behind a world that's a bit better than the one you woke up in, and, the most important of all, deciding your own fate, the cornerstone of destiny since its inception. 
People always said that Cade went out the way he wanted to in Forsaken, in a hunterific blaze of glory looking cool and badass all the while. He was never going to go quietly. Except he did. In Final Shape, he chose to sacrifice himself to keep us, the Guardian, kicking. He saved our ghost, quietly but boldly. He knew his time was up and he knew where he wanted to be when it was. And when I tell you I was a blubbering, crying meltdown of a mess, I was crying so hard I was choking, I was clutching my face, it was so dramatic. And it wasn't just because of Cade, losing Ghost was too much to even begin with, but the second I saw that stupid renegade pop up behind us, I knew exactly what was going to happen and it was so, so elegantly bittersweet, it still makes me cry to this day every time I hear. You're my favourite. Don't ever forget that. I'm on the verge of tears right now, I can't take this anymore. I'm also incredibly glad that Nathan Fillion came back for this final rodeo, it felt fitting. And no surprises, he nailed the performance. Speaking of, there wasn't a single performance amongst this cast that wasn't incredibly good. From Mara at the beginning holding the portal open for us, to Keith David taking on the mantle of Zavala, every single voice actor was really going for it. As I mentioned, I really enjoyed the intense linear fashion of the story, and beyond that I really loved the different ways of delivering that story Bungie employed. There was a plethora of cutscenes, be it in the game engine, rendered, or images. We watched the characters share their thoughts around the various campsites, we talked to Ghost many times, and then conversations would naturally continue on the comms during the mission. They even integrated these moments into the missions, rather than singling them out to before and or after. Cade and Crow talking about Crow wishing to meet Cade, for example, which was teased via a lore piece in Season of the Wish, so I'm glad the confirmation we got was watching the two of them talking to each other about it in the flesh. In my mind, comms during a mission is an easy way of presenting the narrative, which doesn't make them any less important, but it's kind of like baking a cake. You could add vanilla to the sponge, a well-liked flavour, but it's not exciting. People will still eat it and enjoy it and get what they need from it, but you could also add icing, you could add strawberries, you could make a two-tiered cake, you could make a carrot cake and put walnuts in it if you were a psychopath. The point is, when the narrative team were making this cake, they looked in their ingredient cupboard and utilised everything they had in a thoughtful way. The result was a cake that would make Mary Berry cry. I will say some of the campfire conversations did result in some bugs for me. Tiny little things, Cade in the post Taj death scene, full on stayed still at one point, but it wasn't necessarily immersion breaking. Speaking of Zavala and Taj, I loved this mission. I loved Taj as a character, but I didn't personally quite understand the animosity between Ikora and Zavala beforehand. Yes, tensions are high and disagreements make for a dramatic story, but Zavala has a point. It reminds me of the Witch Queen when he bitched out Ikora for acting alone and Eris defended her, which he does bring up. Both Ikora and Eris were in the right in my opinion, but the second Zavala tries to follow that example, going out on his own following his gut, he's told he's making the wrong choice. But he wasn't incorrect about anything, and also why would Ikora of all people cling more to Cade's light vision than Zavala would? She was the one who said in Witch Queen to not focus on the traveller's choices and deal with the problem in front of us, and it felt like Zavala was dealing with the problem in front of us better than Ikora was. I get that Zavala is having a crisis of faith and he's being taunted by the memory of his family again, so I don't hate this, I don't think it brings the story or the narrative down, but it's honestly whatever considering the trailers made it look like he was going to turn to the darkness and betray us, which would have been a worse way to do it in my opinion. And the disagreement gets some good closure in the form of Zavala asking Ikora to teach him how to use stasis in the wake of Taj's death, so there, I proved I'm not a bungee can do no wrong truther. <laughs> Tiny side note, I loved the argument between the OG Vanguard. Cade yelling, you're out of line, particularly felt like the kind of thing he'd probably yelled at either one of them before, and he was protecting Ikora in that moment, so it was a really A plus moment, and the dialogue was fantastic and it was superbly acted, of course. One more bug, or rather technical thing, I want to touch on is the end of the excision mission. Overall, this mission is amazing, wonderful, all our allies helping us was badass, and the cutscene beforehand was so, so fantastic. So, top marks for the mission altogether, but I th think my ghost bugged out at the end? Either that or I just didn't hit the right button. The big penultimate moment where we use our light to defeat the witness, and I realised watching people's clips after the fact that I didn't get the big cool light ray that everyone else did. A shame, but I mean, I was in tears five minutes later, so it was quickly forgotten. <laughs> The only other narrative complaint I have is regarding a character called Shiro 4, which might seem a bit random, especially if there's people watching this that have never played Destiny 1, but stay with me. 
this feels like a situation where Bungie kind of shot themselves in the foot because we haven't seen Shiro in Destiny 2, like, at all. First time we saw him was obviously in Rise of Iron, but considering he's been mentioned in a handful of lore pieces in Final Shape, I was hoping to, at the very least, see him in the excision cutscene. I'm not the only one who has pointed out his absence, but that being said, I do kind of get it. If you read the Man They Called Cade lore book, or pretty much the majority of any lore pieces mentioning Shiro 4, it becomes apparent that before he took the Vanguard Hunter role, Cade and Shiro worked together a lot, especially with Andal Brask, the Hunter Vanguard before Cade. In Rise of Iron, Cade was described as Shiro's mentor, and in Final Shape, Cade called Andal his mentor. Please read the lore book, it explains the story of Cade becoming Vanguard so beautifully. All of this to say that adding Shiro into the story in any capacity might have felt bloated or like a wonky add-on because Shiro just hasn't been here. But you can't have him here without something detailing him having an interaction with a man he canonically honours the death of by putting a lily on top of a stone cairn every year. Which means it would have probably been more awkward to have him in the excision cutscene without having him talk to Cade before Cade died. And who knows if they'll even bring Shiro back in any capacity anyway. We don't actually know what he's doing right now or what he's been doing. So hopefully when he does come back, because <laughs> if he gets killed off screen, I'm going to sue Bungie for emotional damages. We get some kind of insight into how he's feeling about Cade's big sacrifice. That would be all I ask. And as for the epilogue, look, there's not a lot I can say that hasn't already been said. This moment meant a lot. It meant a lot to me to be able to sit and look at the Traveller this mysterious being of great power that we've been questioning for a decade, knowing now what lies inside of it, side by side with my soulmate who I met through this game. Just so wonderful. So perfect. Well, well fucking done, Bungie. And now, for your entertainment. The astronaut sequence right at the beginning, where the astronaut that we saw at the very beginning of Destiny 1 uses both the light and the dark to represent us as a guardian, using both light and dark because the astronaut was the first character we ever saw in Destiny. This had me bawling. Seeing Cade with the harmonica, just fuck, just uh, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Why does he have that harmonica? Where did he get it? Was he revived with it? Was it just sticking around in his memories inside of the Traveller? I was crying, A, because I was seeing him again for the first time, and B, because this was so ridiculous and so on brand, so on character, so wonderful. Uh, just sobbing, absolutely sobbing. This one is self-explanatory, but I call it and Cade hugging the way that she is yelling at him and then they both, they both reach for each other at the exact same time and then they pull themselves and they hug each other for such a long time. Oh, and then he says, I knew you liked me afterwards because of course she did. She missed him the most. Oh God, bawling, absolutely bawling. Zavala and Cade hugging as well. Again, obviously, God, Zavala looked like he needed that hug. I was, uh, so many tears. Taj's death, listen to me, I've had Taj for five minutes, but if anything happened to him, I will kill everyone in this room <laughs> and then myself. That was how I felt going into this mission, and I kind of had a feeling it was going to happen. But when it did actually happen, it, oh my god, it was, it was, that was a gut punch as well. Cade giving Crow the Vanguard cloak was also a really big moment that had me like quite misty eyed. Cade, like literally passing the torch on, must have given Crow so much fucking closure over everything that happened in Forsaken. That moment meant a lot and again just tears just just streaming down my face. It goes without saying but the entirety of Excision, the entirety of Excision. Imagine playing with 11 of the Guardians through tears. Imagine that because it was really really hard. <laughs> this entire scene here, don't touch me, don't come near me, I'm gonna start crying again. Listen, I'm one of these people who was never like hugely attached to Ghost. I think he's cute, I think he's funny, I love Nolan North, like, in this voice. But this moment... Guardian. There you are. Oh. <laughs> this was, this was like, I was calm, and then my tears started up again. Watching children run around the Guardian's feet with the cabal doggies as well. The Guardian just like, trying to like, oh, excuse me, excuse me, you know, children who's gonna actually have a future because of me. Like, oh my god, I was, I was just crying. And then of course, as already mentioned, this epilogue part, when it came up, the entire time it was there, like, until we got kicked out, I was just sobbing. After some deliberation and a Twitter poll, I've decided that I'm going to talk about the Jewel Destiny quest as a kind of unofficial end to the Final Shape story. When I tell you I love this quest, this mission, whatever, and I know, 
I know. The people need to hear my official thoughts on the matter, so... Here it is. Is this... Is it, is, it, is it on? Is it working? Okay, okay, good. Um, only the second one is a clock? The first one is just one to nine. Hey, hey, shut up! Don't be mad at me just because you don't like the truth! Look, I honestly couldn't care less about what you use as a call-out. This is just what worked for me and my partner. We'd actually seen all the discourse on Twitter before we got into the mission. And we tried to do the first one as a clock, but it, it just wasn't working. So we used one to nine. And then the second one, in my opinion, looks more like a clock. So there you go. Logic prevails. <laughs> The real thing we need to be focusing on in this mission is what it means, what it represents. It feels like a comprehensive look back at everything we've learned and reckoned with when it comes to the light and the dark, all tied together with a neat bow in the form of a class item that can only be used when you're using prismatic, the coalescence of two great powers that essentially make up the forms of the universe we're in. With a sarcastic hive got to boot, what's not to love? Well, look at you. Trusting your own instincts, thinking for yourself. I'm so proud. As a side note, over a month later, and I'm still wrapping my mind around Prismatic, so I don't really have a lot of thoughts on it besides it's fun, and I'm so happy that I can strand, grapple, and tether at the same time. It also feels powerful as fuck, and it's super fun, so thumbs up. For me, Dual Destiny is an interesting breakdown of how we as Guardians have gotten to where we are, and a reminder that everything really is our choice. We're unlocking the way forward using both light and dark, we're facing off against enemies that use both light and dark powers, it's all a subtle callback to our journey so far that ends with an interesting question. When it truly comes down to it, what will we choose? Peace or violence? I know people will argue that we haven't really had a lot of agency in the story, and honestly I can't argue with that. The Guardian figuring out the 15th wish was cool and all, but we are for the most part moved along by the inertia of the story. However, my personal theory, and this might be a little bit hopeful on my part, is that this quest is a glimpse into future endeavours by Bungie in terms of our part in the story. Given the way the Guardian reacted to a lot in the Final Shape story, I'm hopeful that there's room for expansion by the way of our Guardian's choices along the way. Not necessarily Mass Effect or Dragon Age level, but let me go ahead and play you a clip from a stream I did with my good friend Kaz a few years ago, before Witch Queen, where we started talking about the RPG of it all within Destiny. When you talk about player agency, what what are you hoping for, or what would you think is is needed to kind of uh, develop that further? So, like, you so you're saying we can't have a Mass Effect, we can't have a Dragon Age. I completely agree with that because that would require basically a complete upheaval of the game. They could only do that with like a Destiny Three, which I don't think they would do, and I don't think they should do. But it. If we're going to use like an, another example of like how to change the narrative just slightly but still end up in the same place, you could look at something like Telltale. Obviously, it's still a very, very different um, game type. But I remember um, seeing something, this was way, way back, um, where someone was basically arguing that Telltale wasn't successful because you never changed the story tons, you always ended up in the same place. And someone else said, well, that is the point. The point is that you you play the story in your own way, but you always end up in the same place. Mm -hmm. Don't know if anyone here has played The Wolf Among Us. I've, I've played, played The, the Walking Dead Us. once. I played The Wolf Among Us. Yeah, that was the only Telltale that I played actually. Fair, because it's my fa it's my favorite one anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, with The Walking Dead as well, like you could still argue with that one too. But I remember someone saying that the person who wrote The Wolf Among Us, because it's based on a comic series, the the person who wrote it, the person who created it, when he played it, he picked a lot of the options that he felt were most in character for Bigby, whereas, you know, as playing the game, if we didn't know him that well as a character, we would play what we think he would do, and he would obviously take, like, a different route. Um, I know that Jonathan Toe, who I, I don't know if he still works at Bungie, I think he does, mm. he's largely responsible for the Drifter's creation, mm -hmm. um, and he wrote The Man With uh, No Name, um, he talked about the Vanguard versus Drifter quest being basically a, a big experiment and mm -hmm. obviously it went over very, very well, but I want to see them do that kind of stuff again because I yeah. think that you could absolutely implement into Destiny, again, ending up at the same end point for all of the players, like having a A, B, C, D of like plot, 
mm-hmm. but having the branches go off and connect from A to B in different ways, depending on what you choose to do. You, you um, can't you can't see it, but I'm like literally like doing finger guns into the air because I've talk- <laughs> just just to jump just to jump in for a quick second. I've talked about this a lot. the The Allegiance Quest was not a fork in the road; it was a spoon. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, how absolutely. I describe it. You choose yeah. left or you choose right. You go in a completely different direction, but you end up in the same place. That's the point. Mm-hmm. You're, you're moving around the spoon to discover uh, and interact with the universe in your own particular way, and you end up still moving the plot forward. If you chose to side with the Vanguard, you learned that what the Drifter's true plans were, and maybe you learned not to uh, be so suspicious of someone, but also you're still kind of half right about Drifter's still shifty, but he's not evil. If you side with the Drifter, you might learn that you know, again, you might learn what his, you're going to learn what his true plans are. And maybe you learn like, okay, he's seen some things that has led him down this road. Maybe the Vanguard needs to, to kind of learn to, to, to open their dogma up a little bit. So yeah, I, I completely agree that there, there's, I think there's a lot of room for that. And I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm very excited about that idea uh, of these. No, I- yeah. Even if you go into the dual destiny quest with someone you've never met before, and we'll get to that in a moment, regardless of if you choose peace or violence, you both still get the class item. Making the destiny story more spoon-shaped, allowing us the agency to at least choose how we react to things and make little changes to the story that still puts us where the narrative team wants us to be, could be really good for player agency. Side note, did you guys know that the first raid I ever did was the Age of Triumph version of King's Fall? Yeah, it took me that long to find a group of people I felt comfortable raiding with, because like hell was I going to suffer through LFG. LFG can be a full-blown nightmare, and I use it nowadays very sparingly, even with Fireteam Finder. A lot of that comes down to obviously being female presenting, but that's a whole other conversation that we just don't have time for here, but it obviously contributes, and I want people to know that it contributes to why people like myself would be nervous going into LFG. That being said, I wouldn't have any Pantheon achievements at all if it wasn't for my partner Tristan LFGing as a team, and ironically enough, the furthest I got in Pantheon was Oryx. All of that to say, I see both sides of the why do I have to play with a stranger to get an exotic item argument. Considering how much of the game I couldn't access in Destiny 1 as a solo player, I am so, so grateful that I have so many friends to help me through content I want to play nowadays. Not everyone does, and considering the kind of dickhead asshole wankers that exist in the world and have access to Xbox Live, I think there needs to be a little bit more understanding when it comes to people who feel as though they've had a blockage placed in front of them. But also, the whole point of this quest is to play in a duo, so I'm not mad at Bungie, and I think it's a perfect quest because of that fact. Swings and roundabouts, you know? I really, really want this quest, this dual destiny quest, to be almost a thesis statement on the future of Destiny's narrative and how we, the player, interact with it. Maybe not in upcoming seasons, but wherever Frontiers is going to end up being would be the perfect opportunity. The reigning theory about Frontiers is that we're going to be exploring beyond our galaxy to find these echoes, so Savathun posing the questions of violence or peace to us is a fantastic seed to plant when it comes to finding new races and new planets. Yeah, we might be the most powerful we've ever been, but how will we use that power? Peace or violence? Hey, I'm back, look at me go! (laughs) Thank you so, so much for watching this video, and before you go, I was hoping you could help me with something. I'm tired of using Twitter polls to help give me a sense of direction of what videos to make next, and I have undiagnosed ADHD and a million video ideas, so if you've made it this far, please comment below on the kind of thing you'd like to see me make, and I'll tell you some things I've got on the brain if that would help you as well. I have a series called Dissecting Destiny, unfortunately it only has one video so far, but the idea behind the series is that I take a topic or theme in Destiny and examine it, talk about it, pick it apart. A topic I've had jotted down for a while is to examine the theme of mentorship in Destiny, and it's been on my mind a lot since watching Kid and Crow interact in Final Shape. There is so much dialogue that shows how desperately Kid is trying to be a good mentor to Crow, and the entire Still Hunt quest is emblematic of that, so it could be a fun thing to examine. I also... <laughs> post Lightfall and post Season of Defiance, barely said that I was going to work on a video about Bungie's mystery storytelling methods, and I'd still like to do that. And you know what, fuck it, here are a few, not all, Destiny video ideas that I have. Some of these are dissecting Destiny, some of them are just like generalised ideas that I've had, but honestly if there's a subject in Destiny that you want to hear me talk about, let me know, throw it downstairs, downstairs, throw it down in the comments below, oh god. 
There's my LGBTQ plus series, of which I've teased a video about Saint and Osiris for a while, but there's plenty of other games I love that have queer representation I've been interested in breaking down and discussing. Like Hades, that's a really big one because it has a wonderful representation of the love the Greeks outlined and wrote stories and plays and poems about. In general, I'd love to make videos about other games I've played and love and kind of not break out of Destiny, but include other games in my wheelhouse of video content. Hades 2 is in early access and I want to review it once the full version is out because I haven't played it yet, but would anyone be interested in that? Let me know. All that to say, cringe call to action in coming here, but uh, <laughs> please comment below to tell me what you'd like to see next, and if you do, thank you so, so much. Like, subscribe, all that jazz, it lets me know that there are people watching my stuff and that they want to see more. My socials are in the description if you want to see me yell at people on Twitter, it is uh, bumping right now, I'll tell you that much. And I will see you in the next video, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for watching, stay safe, stay happy, bye bye.